I started collaborating with Thibault at about the same time as Herman, so 20 years ago. And uh, it has been one of my most uh, fruitful and uh, uh, enjoyable uh, collaborations. Fruitful because I learned a lot of things, not only uh, the material, but also the way to address uh, physics problems. And cheerful because, uh, well, it's a pleasure to work with Thibault. He's always enthusiastic and he's never in bad mood, I d when he does physics, at least. <laughs> 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 so, um, well, we worked on the subject that Herman addressed already uh, in the previous lecture, uh, the Belinsky Lifshitz Kalatnikov of uh, general relativity in the vicinity of a space like singularity, which was in the work of uh, BKL, a cosmological singularity for definiteness, but that can be a space like singularity in the future, and actually the analysis might be more relevant for such singularities. Um, <coughs> and um, I will address uh, this problem not by following, let's say, the standard point of view. I will follow a different point of view. Um, well, after all, as we learned from the previous lecture, we are a bit stuck. So I think developing alternative uh, approaches to BKL and understanding BKL and the implications of BKL, I think, should be welcome. And also, historically, it's actually the way I got interested uh, in BKL uh, a long time ago. So that has to do with the uh, so-called ultra-relativistic limit of uh, gravity. And uh, that can be, uh, so I, I'm not sure it will be useful, but I think at least it's uh, fun. Okay. So if you look at the Poincaré algebra, which describes uh, relativistic physics, uh, it has it, can, it has many contractions, and there are at least two interesting ones. One which is rather familiar is the Galilean algebra, which you obtain by taking the limit uh, when the speed of light, where the speed of light goes to infinity. Of course, you, ha you have to be ma more precise when you define the uh, contraction. You have to, sit to say which, which generators are perhaps after a definition kept finite and which are not. And uh, so this is a bit sketchy, but you take C go to infinity and you can see and you redefine the boost generator B, Bi, and the energy uh, E, uh, as I've shown on the slide. Let's see, yes, it works. And so if you do that, you find that the boost now commute and uh, also the energy momentum relation uh, so the commutation with the boost of pi and e are modified. So you get a zero here. Well, actually, there is also the Bachmann algebra, I will say uh, one word, where there is a central extension. But I will say that on the next slide. That's a limit which is familiar to us. So velocity is small with respect to the speed of light. And then there is another limit, you and another contraction of the Poincaré algebra that you can consider which is uh, the opposite contraction where the speed of light goes to zero. And so if you make these redefinitions and keep the new generators finite in the limit, well, you can show that again the boost will uh, commute. Well, Cb, well, there will be a C squared here and C goes to zero, so you get a zero. And the, energy m the commutation of the boost with the energy and the momentum will be changed, but now it changed somehow in the opposite uh, direction. So E with B is zero, but P with B uh, produces E, so the opposite to that. Now, the Galilean algebra, uh, or actually really the Bachmann ex uh, ex extension, which, is, which has a central charge, so in the commutation, in the, when I say commutation relation here, I'm really, well, you can use the generators and it's really a commutation relation. If you are Hamiltonian minded, these are the Hamiltonian generator and it's a Poisson bracket relation. So, well, whatever they are, so let me use the word commutation relations of P with B. Instead of having zero, you can actually allow for a central extension, which is the mass, and this leads to uh, the Bachmann algebra. Well, it, has, it is well known that this uh, is actually uh, relevant for the non-relativistic uh, limit of uh, Einstein theory, so the New Newton-Cartan gravity. And the Carroll algebra is relevant for its ultra-relativistic limit, the opposite limit, which is sometimes called 
Carroll gravity because the Carroll algebra, well, because it's based on the Carroll algebra. And the, the term Carroll algebra was coined, I should have said it on the previous uh, transparency, by Levy Leblanc, who was uh, studying the uh, possible uh, contractions of the Poincaré uh, symmetry. And actually, and this is why I'm talking about the uh, Carroll, algebra, Carroll algebra here, the ultra-relativistic limit controls the dynamics of the gravitational field near a space-like singularity, so the so-called belinsky kalatnikov limit, BKL limit of uh, gravity. And as we heard in the previous uh, talk, it has revealed intriguing connections with infinite dimensional Katz-Moody algebras, which in the case of uh, Maximal supergravity is E10. <coughs> and so I would like to describe in this talk some more uh, Carroll invariant theories and uh, briefly review the connection with the K BKL behavior. And so I will first discuss Carroll causality, so causality in Carroll invariant theories, which is extremely simple. And I will compare and contrast it with the uh, causality in Galilean invariant theories. And the main point that I want to make can already be illustrated on a very simple equation, on a simple system, a scalar field in Minkowski space, uh, which is Poincaré invariant and described by the Klein-Gordon equation. Here is a Klein-Gordon equation where I kept the factor of C explicit. And uh, we want to see what, what are the limits of this, this equation when C goes to infinity and when C goes to zero. Well, when in the non-relativistic limit, so when C goes to infinity, time derivatives are dominated by spatial gradients, and the equation reduces, well, you drop this to the familiar uh, Laplace equation for phi. In the if there was a source, uh, it would be the Poisson equation, which implies instantaneous action at a distance. Uh, if I have a source here, rho, and modify the source, immediately the field phi will, will, will feel it and will adjust to the change in the source. So this is a familiar non-relativistic limit of uh, the Klein-Gordon equation. Um, and in terms of geometric structure, one can understand this as uh, the fact that the line cones completely open to the hyperplanes x0 equal to constant. C goes greater and greater. In the limit, the aperture of the light cone gets uh, maximum and light cones become hyperplanes. And so causality is very simple. You have to move uh, forward in the future light cone. That means uh, f just forward in x0. Okay, so any uh, motion with thing x0 is causally possible. Now let's look at the opposite limit, Carroll invariant uh, theories. So in the ultra relativistic limit, it's just the opposite. So if I go back to the, to the Klein-Gordon equation, now this term will, uh, so time derivatives, uh, so this is meaningful when time derivatives dominate spatial gradients. And so you drop uh, spatial gradients in the Clairondon equation. Interestingly enough, you could still get something that depends on time. So that still, it is still a dynamical theory. It has actually the same number of degrees of freedom as the relativistic uh, expression. But you see that, uh, well, it's a very simple equation. It's just an ordinary differential equation with respect to time. And that is the opposite limit in which the light cones, instead of opening completely, uh, they completely collapse. So they collapse to what? To a line, to, to, to the lines. I mean, at each point, uh, xk equal to constant. So there is a tangent vector d by dt. Um, and so with Carroll causality, the field at time t, well, it's very, I mean, these are ordinary differential equations with respect to time, will depend only on the field and its first time derivative at time t equal to zero, at the, but at the same sp spatial point. So nothing is, uh, no information goes from one spatial point to, to another one. Okay, you have to propagate along the line cone, which in this case is just uh, the line xk equal constant uh, from which you start, okay? And so for that reason, sometimes the word Ultra relativistic is uh, ultra local is used for uh, ultra relativistic because you stay at the same point. And uh, more generally, if you consider a more complicated system, and I will illustrate that with p forms, which is relevant to the analysis uh, 
uh, we did with Thibault. Um, dynamical equations in Carroll invariant uh, theories will reduce to ordinary differential equations with respect to time, so that the field at one point and, w and some time is completely determined by the field at the same point at the initial time and some of its time derivatives. Okay. Now, actually, when I was uh, discussing uh, the klein gordon equation, I wrote things in such a way I could discuss easily the electric limit, well, what is now called the electric limit of the klein gordon equation. There is another way, and there are probably many other ways, to take, uh, by appropriate rescalings, uh, limits where c goes to zero or c goes to infinity. And another one, actually, is called the magnetic limit which has also similar causality features, but the Klein-Gordon equation will reduce to some other equation compatible with Carroll uh, causality. And uh, this actually has been discussed and goes by many people and goes back to the uh, work of uh, Lebelac and Lévy-Leblanc of 1973, where they showed that for electromagnetism there are actually two limits, electric and magnetic. And then that was extended to Carolian electromagnetism in by uh, these people more recently. Well, interest in the in Carroll group actually arose also because it's connected with the BMS symmetry since uh, it acts on null uh, hypersurfaces and on null hypersurfaces clearly the, the intersection with the light cone is a line like here. And uh, the generalization of this construction to more general theories in arbitrary dimensions has been considered more, more recently, actually, by uh, more, more simultaneously by uh, these two groups of uh, authors. Okay, so I will actually illustrate the other limit, the magnetic limit, in the case of P forms. And the best, which so I'm now considering P form gauge theories in arbitrary dimensions, and the best way to discuss these limits. I know something is happening with the microphone. No. Uh, the best way to discuss these limits is to write the series in Hamiltonian form and then one clearly sees what is kept and what uh, in the various limits and why one is called electric and the other is called magnetic. Now the Hamiltonian action for a p-form reads as follows. So um, the p-form is described by the p-form potential, which is a, which is a p-form. Uh, in the Hamiltonian description, only the spatial components and the conjugate momenta define the phase space. The components with a zero, with a time index, are Lagrange multiplier for constraints. So the Hamiltonian action, or the action in Hamiltonian form, will contain uh, the spatial components of the p-form, conjugate momenta, and that's a characteristic pq dot term of uh, telling us that p and a are conjugate pairs. And then uh, there is a an energy density, which I called H, and there is a constraint coming with its Lagrange multiplier, which is A0. It's a gauge theory, and we know that in any gauge theory there are constraints, and the constraints, at least some of the constraints, the first class ones, generate the gauge symmetry, and we but that's the only thing we have here. And uh, so here is the explicit expression. The energy density first, well, it's really, e it's really the analog of uh, the electromagnetic case that we know very well, where the energy density is E squared plus B squared. E squared is the square of the electric field, is the electric energy density. The electric field is, uh, is really pi, so um, I get pi squared for the electric energy density. Then the magnetic energy density is the square of the magnetic field, which is so B squared, but here we have P forms in dimension, so that's uh, spatial components of the curvature F. So that's for H, it has two, it's E squared plus B squared, are two electric, magnetic. And then there is a constraint which is really Gauss's law for these P forms that tells us that in the absence of sources, which is the case I considered, the divergence of the electric field is equal to zero. Of course, if they were sources, uh, <coughs> that they would be sources. Okay, whoops, how much time do I, I started late, no? Yes. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> 15, okay. Um, now, 
well, maybe I should have stressed C. So you see that uh, the velocity of light, so I uh, naturally, with this choice of variables, naturally appears here, C squared, and there is no velocity of light here. So if you take this, the magnetic limit is actually the one that you obtain by the direct C goes to zero limit of that expression, and you cross out then this term. You have only the magnetic energy th that survives. What is the gauge group here? Sorry? What is the gauge group here? The? What is the gauge group here? Ah, the gauge group is the group, uh, it's adding to the P form uh, the exterior derivative of a P minus 1 form. And you can show that if you take the bracket of uh, the variable with the uh, constraints, sandwiched with the gauge parameter of that transformation I just described, so a P minus 1 form, you will produce exactly the gauge transformations. So that's a gauge symmetry. It's abelian. Um, now, the, op the electric limit is, well, you have to do first some rescaling of the fields to put actually the speed of light, to transfer the speed of light from the electric energy density to the magnetic energy density. So you do this rescaling and this opposite rescaling because you want to keep P conjugate to A and the bracket P with A should be, I mean, or A with P should be 1 and not C or 1 over C. So you want to keep that. Uh, I mean, this is the way you normalize uh, things. But then you can make this transformation and then take the limit. And in that case, what instead of dropping the electric energy density, you drop the magnetic energy density and you remain with the electric energy density. Both limits are compatible with gauge invariance because the electric field and the magnetic field are gauge invariant. So you are not spoiling gauge invariance by taking the limit. Uh, and it takes the same form. There is no C in the constraint. And uh, actually, it's, so it's compatible with chiral invariance. That's easy to check. You can write the transformation of the field and verify gauge invariance. But a, a more direct way to check gauge, gauge invariance, uh, sorry, chiral invariance in the Hamiltonian formulation is to observe that in the case of Carroll invariant theories, so in both of case limits that I considered, the, com the electric field, sorry, the electric energy density only contains the, the momenta. So momenta with momenta is zero, so the bracket here is clearly equal to zero. And in the magnetic limit, the magnetic energy density only contains the Qs, and Q with Q is zero, so uh, you get this bracket relationship. The energy density at two different spatial points uh, commute in Carroll invariant theory, so which, which is in contrast with um, uh, Poincaré invariant theories where you would get here the momentum density as was explained uh, long ago by uh, Schwinger and uh, Dirac. Uh, the, the commutation relations of the energy density and momentum density reflect uh, Poincaré invariants. Well, in our case they reflect Carroll invariants and it's simpler, it's zero here, instead of having terms proportional to the momentum density. And it's clear that this will imply straightforwardly when you compute the total energy and the boost generator, which are obtained by uh, integrating the energy density, that's for E, and integrating the energy density, but with, I mean, the first moment, with Xk to get the boost generator, because E with E is equal to zero, E being either E electric or E magnetic, when you compute these brackets, you clearly get zero, which is indeed what you should get in a Carroll invariant theory. So this actually implies the characteristic brackets of Carroll invariant uh, field theories. Um, in the case of um, Poincaré, uh, we would not have that, and so the brackets here would be m the ones of the Poincaré algebra. Now, uh, I described the limits in the case of uh, electromagnetism uh, sorry, and p-form theories. One can do the same for gravity. And again, it's easier to do it at, in the Hamiltonian formulation. And I will only describe the electric limit. And so I will start with the Dirac ADM Hamiltonian action for Einstein gravity, which reads, well, let me, as follows. So you have the spatial metric and its conjugate momentum the lapse and the shift, which are really the temporal components of the metric, which acts as a Lagrange multiplier for constraints. There is a surface term, but Stanley talk about, uh, talk, talked about it yesterday, so I don't have to talk it to about it today. It depends on the boundary conditions, uh, and I'm not going to discuss bound the behavior of the fields at infinity in this talk. So uh, let's not write the boundary term that might be there if necessary. 
Now, the Hamiltonian constraint, and this is a moment, so-called momentum constraint, and they have the following expressions. And, uh, well, I have already simplified the expression of H to, by redefining the fields and redefining the laps, actually. This will be shown on the next transparency, but I want to make the point first, and then I will discuss that issue. Uh, if you rescale appropriately thing and, uh, things and uh, redefine variables, this is what you get for the energy, uh, Hamiltonian constraint and the momentum constraint. The Hamiltonian constraint has two terms, one which is quadratic in the momenta, where uh, the width supermetric here uh, in front, or the inverse of the supermetric, since we are uh, working with the momenta here, uh, as which was uh, discussed in the previous lecture. And then we have uh, the curvature, which come and they come with different powers of C, and you can adjust these things to be that, that way by appropriate rescalings. And so you see that if you take the limit C goes to zero, you are just dropping the spatial curvature, so spatial gradients. And this is a consistent limit because it does not spoil the number of gauge, I mean the, gauge, the number of gauge symmetries. It will take a different form, but it, you don't spoil it because all the constraints, which are first class in Einstein gravity, remain first class in the limit. And actually these ones become even simpler because they are just, uh, they just commute. In the Einstein gravity, this would contain hk, but here we get in the limit uh, zero. So they are first class, and uh, the Carroll electric limit of Einstein gravity is just uh, the kinetic term in the Hamiltonian constraint. Now, uh, I, as I said, you have to do some rescaling. So if you put back all the constants and uh, don't rescale, so n is the unrescaled uh, lapse, and h would be the unrescaled Hamiltonian. If you rescale things, which actually I was already uh, doing, this is the expression you get. I, I mean, if you keep everything, and I have rescaled to, to make... Uh, so you, you, you get the... You, we know that in the Einstein action, we have the gravitational coupling constant, g, we have c, and there is some numerical factor. And uh, this is actually the expression of the Hamiltonian constraint once you have rescaled the lapse in this way. So I, I pull out some factors in order to have one here. Uh, but then this is what you get really in front of, of the spatial curvature. You see that actually you get indeed this c squared, but you get also a factor of 1 over g squared. And there is this factor epsilon, which has been uh, called by uh, Claudio Teitelbaum the Hamiltonian signature of space-time because he was asking the following question. Suppose that I want to write the Hamiltonian formulation of Euclidean gravity. So I change the signature of the me uh, space-time metric. What would be the uh, expression of the constraints? Some people thought that this might change the signature of the De Witt supermetric, which, is, which has Lorentzian signature, but it doesn't. So this, is, this stays unchanged. It remains a Lorentzian uh, Actually, it's a metric on the symmetric, sp or quasi symmetric space, a GLN over SON, so that you are not going to change. But the signature comes here. And actually, it will reflect. There is an epsilon which comes here, but of course, when you take the limit. And so this is really the Hamiltonian signature of space time. For Minkowskian signature, you get a minus sign. For Euclidean signature, you get a plus sign. So this is how you can tell from the constraint whether you are dealing with Euclidean gravity or Minkowskian gravity. And so, because of all this, you see that the limit c goes to zero, which I was considering, the Carroll limit, is actually equivalent to the limit where g, the gravitational coupling constant, goes to zero. And actually, that was considered by Isham b even before, uh, and he called it the strong coupling limit, because of that reason. It was just setting g goes to infinity. Or, and that was the terminology used by Claudio, uh, epsilon is equal to zero. You go halfway between Euclidean and Minkowskian, but actually that's precisely where the light cone collapses to, to zero, before even completely disappearing. And so that was also called the zero uh, Hamiltonian signature limit of general relativity. In all cases, you get a consistent system. But, so, but that's also equivalent to the Carroll limit. I just wanted to, to point that out. This k in the previous Euclidean metric, is it the same as m? Which? G i j k m, and there is a generalized momentum by m n. Oh, I'm sorry. You are very, uh, <laughs> you are really reading everything. So indeed, m k m should be k k m here. I mean, thus it's summed. Let's see. Did I? Yes. Yeah, so it's really a copy and paste of a of an incorrect formula all the way through. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
so indeed, it's, it's all indices are saturated. Now, it turns out, this is just on a side remark, that this action that I just wrote in Hamiltonian form in the Carolian limit can be written covariantly, but the objects are not uh, Riemannian metric. They are actually uh, degenerate metric. Uh, but then if the de metric is degenerate, the term is zero. You don't have a volume element, so you have also to bring in a volume element, and you get the same number of degrees of freedom or of independent fields as in Einstein gravity in the Hilbert action formula. And you can write the action in a covariant way in terms of the lead derivative uh, of the degenerate metric along the null vector, I mean defining the light cones, normalized this way. So this is an aside remark, but that's actually my interest in uh, Carroll uh, from some time ago. Um, now there is also a magnetic limit in which actually you keep the curv spatial curvature and drop uh, the kinetic term in the Hamiltonian constraint and uh, that has been considered uh, recently but also by other uh, authors. So why is this relevant to um, the BKL limit, it turns out that in the vicinity of a space-like singularity, five, okay. Uh, but now I'm, I'm on uh, known territory and Hermann covered uh, part of it. So um, the, the gravitation, the description of the gravitational field coupled to P forms, as in extended supergravity models, can be described in very simple terms. Doesn't mean that the motion itself is simple, but you can describe tell which motion in it is in, in simple terms because time derivatives dominate and so if you in the limit if where you drop spatial gradients the description of the dynamics will be just ordinary differential equations with respect to time and at each spatial point you would have the generalized Kastner solution I'm saying generalized because there will also be some expression for the p-forms in which the spatial gradients are set equal to zero so you get a uh, homogeneous solution of the <coughs> Einstein p-form equation uh, at each spatial point. And this is the BKL limit and uh, it leads to, it turns out that this dynamics uh, can be re-expressed by change of variables to uh, the dynamics of a ball moving in a billiard, the billiard itself being in a, re being a region or the billiard tape being a region of hyperbolic space. Okay, but this is precisely the ultra-relativistic Carolian limit where time derivatives dominate spatial gradients. So the limit of the Einstein equations close to a sp space-like singularity is precisely controlled by the limit uh, which is compatible with Carroll invariance. Now, I should say that for pure gravity, so uh, it's important to have the p-forms to, to have this statement 100% uh, uh, correct, so correct, in other words. For pure gravity, the spatial gradients cannot be set equal to zero for all times as you go to the singularity. There is always a, a bounce uh, to some, uh, again, some uh, curvature wall, so the curvature plays an important role. It can be replaced by an effective effective term that depends only on the fields, but nevertheless it cannot be completely set equal to zero. However, in the presence, presence of p-forms, it turns out that the bounce is due to the so-called curvature walls. Are, uh, well, the curvature walls are subdominant with respect to the electric wall, so if you keep the electric energy density of the p-form, which is what the Carroll limit does, you can uh, consistently drop the curvature walls and the, the collision with the electric walls take into account the dynamics to leading order. And so you, you get a, uh, a complete Carroll description. Uh, now actually it turns out that for the, for gravity you have always to keep the, it's always the electric limit which is relevant near a space like singularity. If you couple two p-forms, sometimes it is the electric limit of the p-form Lagrangian that you have to take, sometimes it's a magnetic limit. It depends on the space-time dimension and the rank P of the P-form. But in both, in all cases, you can uh, have a Carroll description. So in the particular case of 11-dimensional supergravity, which is uh, a particular interest, so maximal supergravity, the bosonic field content is 11-dimensional, uh, well, is a metric and a three-form, 
and it turns out that it is the electric energy of the three forms that dominate in that case. And so the BKL limit is equivalent to taking the electric Carolio limit for both gravity and the three form, so in which you keep in the Hamiltonian constraint, where now we have also the energy momentum density, but you take, so you keep the kinetic term here and the electric energy density of the three form. Now there are also terms, in general, in the, in the full theory, there are terms which contain the curvature as we have seen. Actually, it's multiplied by C6, the curvature, and I think B squared is multiplied by C squared. Uh, and the, moment, the magnetic energy density, but in this Carolian limit, they disappear, and this is the correct limit as you go to the singularity. Um, and you can actually also keep the Chern Simons term in the Carolian limit, uh, it survives, in fact. Now, uh, and this dynamics is uh, uh, in that limit, as we have heard, uh, has been shown to have remarkable properties because you, the billiard that you get is not just any billiard, but is a fundamental veil chamber of E10. Uh, and this has, uh, exhibits, remark well, at least points to remarkable connections with hidden symmetries. Um, but this is already, uh, this is true in the Carolian limit. I mean, you, you are not losing this important feature. On the contrary, you, you, put, you see it more clearly in the Carolian limit of uh, uh, the theory. So let me conclude. So we know very well since the early days and, since from, and from our uh, teaching that the non-relativistic limit of gravity is, is quite useful in general relativity and very powerful methods exist to control development in powers of 1 over C. The opposite ultravistic limit, as I try to argue, is also useful. It is connected to the B so, and so physically relevant uh, because it's connected to the BKL analysis in the vicinity of a space-like singularity. Actually, it appears also in other gravity-related contexts and cosmology, for instance, in that recent uh, preprint, where they argue that uh, the energy momentum tensor of, of a perfect fluid in the uh, Carolian limit should have the equation of state P plus rho is equal to zero, so this, which is relevant for dark energy. But uh, a systematic p expansion in powers of C remains to be more fully investigated. There is some interesting work by uh, Dautkour from some time ago, but I think that this uh, deserves to be better understood uh, in the context of the BKL uh, limit. And uh, before I thank you, maybe I can close by saying that actually this last transparency so shows uh, the range of interests of Thibault in terms of the speed of light, it goes all the way from C goes to infinity, the non-relativistic limit, to C equal to zero, the BKL analysis. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice talk and keeping the time. Who has two questions? Oh, <laughs> yes, there is a question. Please. Yeah. So if you, if you just replace this uh, abelian gauge group by non-abelian, if you impose some duality between magnetic and electric uh, component, then we get SL2Z. And then the solution of this uh, wheeler gavit equation, psi, as in, in the previous talk, then if we impose SL2Z invariance, then we get an automorphic form. Is it true or something? I would think that this is true too, because uh, you see the curve. Here we have the same G, uh, the same wheel uh, supermetric. We have the same superspace. Uh, it's just that the dynamics is different. But I, I would think that all these constructions based on symmetries uh, remain uh, valid. So just uh, imposing a non mm -hmm. group is set. But it's okay. Uh, I'm not sure. It's, uh, there are probably two things involved in the questions. Okay. okay. Oh. We can talk after if you want. Okay. okay. Last quick question. There's nothing on the chat, so thank you very much. Thank you.